guys and welcome to episode 172 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now in this episode I got on therapist Jamie Valdez and uh, it was good to finally get her on and we talk about many topics including uh, addiction. So we go into that a bit because she works with addiction quite a bit. She talks about um, in the context of harm OCD um, about the obsessions being kind of false alarms going off in your head. Um, we talk around that. We talk about paedophile themed OCD and uh, what does ERP look like for this theme. Um, so if you've wondered, uh, she goes into detail there. Uh, she talks quite a lot about acceptance and commitment therapy, um, using that in sessions while treating OCD and how it kind of works, can work alongside uh, ERP as well. Um, we talk about creative approaches to treating OCD, which is really interesting. And then uh, I ask her about when's the right time to uh, decrease the amount of therapy you have uh, and get a bit more independence maybe, which was a question I got from one of you guys. So thank you for that. Uh, and then the usual words of hope. And uh, Jamie also goes into her own therapy story and her own mental health story. Uh, yeah, so I think you really enjoy this. Uh, Jamie's very clear of what she says and uh, I've, I learned a lot. So without further ado, here is Jamie. On the podcast today, I have Jamie Valdez. Jamie is the owner of Clearview OCD Counseling, a private psychotherapy practice just outside of Boston. Jamie is a licensed mental health counselor and serves on the board of directors for OCD Massachusetts and OCD Rhode Island. Jamie is particularly interested in providing inclusive treatment for all people living with OCD, including those with substance use disorders, self-harming behaviours, suicidality, as well as those in the LGBTQ, persons of colour and other underserved communities. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me on. No worries. <laughs> I thought I was going to pass out there for uh, reading. <laughs> I forget to take a breath at the halfway point. Um, cool. So thank you for coming on. Um, as you know, I always get people to share whether they have an OCD story that or with, with clinicians kind of be good to hear what's your therapy story, you know, why get into therapy in particular OCD. So one of the things I've actually been working on both personally and professionally in the past year is coming out with my own OCD story. Um, and so I'm going to work on that on your podcast, which has a cool. pretty wide reach, I believe. <laughs> um, so a little exposure for myself today. Um, I always knew that I came from a highly anxious family lineage. And ever since I was a child, I had struggles with phobias, panic attacks. I had a fear of swimming in like large bodies of water, flying on an airplane, public speaking. Anytime I had to do anything in the classroom, like walk up to the front of the classroom to get a paper that my teacher was passing back, I would have a panic attack. Um, so I knew that that was just kind of like part of my life and that a lot of my relatives struggled with it. Um, and then I always knew that I wanted to be a therapist. So I did kind of the traditional track of psychodynamic um, talk therapy, but it wasn't helping my panic attacks or phobias. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able to help any of my clients that were coming through the door with those similar issues. Um, so I started just doing some research on my own about like, how do you treat these kinds of things? And I came across exposure therapy. So I tried it on myself and found that it worked very, very well. <laughs> um, and a few years later, like after I overcame a lot of my phobias and all that, um, I was finding myself specializing a lot in trauma or PTSD counseling. Um, and through that training found that there was a protocol called prolonged exposure developed by Edna Foa. Um, and I started using that with my clients and found that it worked amazingly well to help trauma and PTSD. Um, so then I was like, Hmm, can exposure therapy, you know, be used, you know, in a very broad way for all these things, like the way that I help myself and then also with the trauma counseling. And so then I just got really into finding out all the different ways that exposure therapy could be used. And the more OCD came through my door, the more fascinated I got by it and found myself an OCD therapist. Mm. Nice. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for going into the detail. Um, and you also did creative arts therapy. Is that correct? 
Mm -hmm. So my original master's degree is in expressive arts therapies. Um, so it is um, a counseling degree, like you do get licensure in mental health counseling, similar to a social work degree, but you have a specialty in using creative and flexible approaches with visual arts, music, um, you know, mixed media, uh, storytelling, things like that to help support the therapeutic process. Wow. No, thank you for going into that. I've got a question on that later, so it would be mm -hmm. good, good to unpack that. And how, how are you doing now of your own kind of mental health story? <laughs> I'm doing very well. I have overcome all of my phobias except for my fear of public speaking. And so what I've been doing the past few years is just doing public speaking and bringing my fear with me up on the stage and using my fear of public speaking to show how you can do something that feels really scary to you mm. and still do the valued behavior and live the life that you want to live. I'd rather be the person who does the public speaking and is scared while doing it than sits in the corner and doesn't help other people. Absolutely. Um, and if you ever come to London, there's a, is it Hyde Park? Yeah, Hyde Park. There's a, there's a corner. I think it's called Speaker's Corner. It's been nicknamed. And mm -hmm. usually on the weekends you go there and there's people who've got like plastic crates or wooden boxes they stand on and they effectively just give a sermon or a lecture, whether it's on religion or politics or I don't know how, for whatever it is. Uh, and that's a great way to improve your public speaking. And in random That sounds like people, a nightmare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do it. I yeah. would do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, baptism by fire. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for going into that. Um, so you do a lot of addiction. Uh, people. I do. Um, so what, what we know about OCD and addiction is mm -hmm. that one in four people who suffer from OCD also suffer from addiction to alcohol or substance use. And that's not even accounting for things like process addictions, like video gaming or pornography. Um, so we also know that that one in four number is only the people who are willing to report that they self-medicate their OCD. So we, we do know, and I'm sure that a lot of therapists who are listening to this right now know that people who are walking in the door into their private practice um, or into their clinic are either reporting or hiding the fact that they are self-medicating in some way. So I am passionate about seeing that as a reality for at least 25% of the people with OCD um, that needs to be treated along with the OCD. Yeah, uh, yeah those big numbers. Um, and just before we get into that a bit more, um, what's a process addiction? You mentioned pornography and video gaming. What do mm -hmm. they mean by the word process? So those would be things that involve kind of, I mean, there, there's a lot of overlap with, um, with OCD where it's a repetitive behavior that you're engaging in that you feel a strong urge for. It may not have an addictive quality in the same way that, for instance, cocaine might. Like um, a chemical addiction. Exactly. Um, but we know that there's a lot of overlap with various eating disorders, whether it's, um, you know, some kind of anorexia or an avoidant restrictive um, eating disorder where they're just averse to different food textures. Um, but we know that there's a lot of overlap with other disorders, including various kinds of compulsive disorders like compulsive shopping, compulsive gambling, things like that. Okay, cool. No, thank you for that. Um, so let, let's take sort of um, alcohol and, and drugs. Um, I should say illegal drugs usually, but I guess it could be legal as well in saying could that. Could be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so but someone comes in with both OCD and uh, addiction to some kind of substance. Uh, what's kind of your approach to working with that person? So, I mean, I, I can only really speak to my approach because yeah. – um, one thing that, that we do find in a lot of OCD treatment is that many people have to be abstinent from self-medicating in any way in order to receive the exposure therapy, yeah. um, which makes a lot of sense theoretically. It just hasn't really been practical with the populations that I actually work with. And so what I do is I do a concurrent treatment plan where I'm treating both things at the same time, and I'm treating them in a very similar way. Um, so I'm looking at 
what is the function of this behavior? So just as a classic OCD example, what is the function of your hand washing? Why are you doing that so much? What are you trying to get done? And is it working in the way that you want it to work? And then we're looking at why are you drinking every night? And is that working in the way that you want it to work? And then we're looking at reducing those behaviors, substituting with more adaptive behaviors, looking for flexibility within the behavioral repertoire. So can you have one glass of wine, then a glass of water, then another glass of wine? Can you start kind of showing some flexibility in what you're doing? Um, I choose to treat those things at the same time because there's so much overlap. And the goal in general for people is to mute out the anxiety or the shame or the guilt that they're experiencing from the OCD, which is then compounded by the fact that they're also abusing substances. So now they have double the shame, anxiety, and guilt. So rather than focusing on getting rid of those things, I'm doing just a very strict behavioral approach of how can we get you to get behaviors in place that are actually getting you what you were looking to achieve. Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just the, sort of the harm reduction approach. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, thank you for explaining that. Um, and like you said, everyone has a different approach, but um, it's, yeah, like you said, it's it's tough to try and get people to completely come off a substance for a certain amount of days when there's a good chance they're using that substance, as you said, to get out of their head effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one. So it's good to see you, you uh, doing the two together. I've had a lot of success with it. Um, okay. it works very well when, when you're treating both at the same time. Yeah. And I can imagine from the person in the, in the therapy room is that they feel, I can imagine they feel less judged because you're not trying to say you have to be off it or I'm not going to help you. You're saying, let's do it. Let's work with what you've got sort of thing. I also can't tell you how many clients I've worked with who say you're the third OCD therapist I've met with, or I've already done two programs and I lied to them the entire time about my usage because I knew that it was going to X me out of access to ERP treatment. It's nice to know that I can work with you on both things. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And also I'm guessing if someone did want to do abstinence, you'd, Mm -hmm. you'd support them in that process too. Absolutely. If it works for the person, I'm looking for what's working. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. No, thank you for that. Um, Changing now to themes. I got a couple of theme specific questions. So uh, one around harm themed OCD, um, which is how do you incorporate ERP and and or act skills when false alarms are going off about their actual level of risk to those around them? So one of the things I talk about is that these are false alarms. Um, an example that I use is if, um, if they were cooking in the kitchen and they had the oven on broil at 500 mm. and then they opened the oven to check on their little mushroom caps or whatever's going on in there and that waft of hot air comes out and sets off the smoke detector What they're doing in this moment is calling the fire department, running outside to get the hose and hose the entire house down because they believe the house is on fire. Um, What I'm getting them to do instead is recognize that that was a false alarm. It may have been very loud when they opened the oven and it set off the smoke detector. Um, But all they need to do is kind of just grab the spatula and, you know, push that button to get it to turn off um, rather than over respond, even if the alarm is very loud. So when we're working with people with harm OCD, a lot of it for for me is to do a lot of psychoeducation. So I'm teaching my clients the difference between what's an ego syntonic thought versus an ego dystonic thought. So we might have two women who both present to the emergency room for suicidal ideation. One of them is despondent, hopeless. She's lost her grandmother. She is having a hard time at work. And the images and thoughts that she's having are congruent with her actual desires and wishes. She actually does want to take herself out of the game as a way of relieving her distress. Mm. Girl number two is having the exact same thoughts and images of hurting herself, but she doesn't want to be having these images. Those are dystonic thoughts. They're not congruent with her sense of self, with her desires, her wishes with what she wants to do with her behavior. 
So I talk with people about kind of like, where do you fall on this line? And sometimes it's not a clear line. Sometimes people are so distressed that they're having a lot of dystonic thoughts about hurting themselves. But then occasionally it's kind of like, you know what, maybe this is just too hard. And then, you know, occasionally there's a syntonic thought in there where they're like, maybe I should just end this. So one of the things we want to do is allow people to have gray areas in their OCD recovery where they can talk about all the pieces of being human, which can be really complicated and normalize that for them. So a lot of it for me in the front end is providing education about what these thoughts are, which ones are false alarms. And if it's a false alarm, how to respond with your behavior in a way that's congruent to the actual situation, not to the alarm. Hmm. Okay. Now, thank you. That, that was a good explanation. Um, so then, so then using that, so someone is having these ego dystonic thoughts, for example, around, um, harming someone else, for example, um, what are some of the approaches of using either ELP or ACT or both to, mm -hmm. to address that? Um, so I have a little bit of a unique background in this because, um, as I mentioned before, I used to be a trauma therapist and about half of my work was working with survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault. And then the other half of my work was actually working with the perpetrators, the people who actually caused the harm to others. So I have this unique perspective of knowing what an actual perpetrator of violence or sexual assault looks like um, and what would kind of be distinguishing characteristics between that person and somebody with pedophile OCD or harm OCD. Um, so at the risk of being too reassuring to my clients, one of the things I go over in the beginning is what, what are the differences between an actual perpetrator and somebody who's having intrusive thoughts or images? What we then work on, um, at this point, I primarily use an act-based approach. Um, and so what, what we work on is having a way of being able to sit with and tolerate whatever the intrusive imagery or thoughts or urges are while having valued behavior. So if you're a father and you have a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old daughter, and you're not changing the two-year-old's diapers, you're not bathing either of the girls because you're afraid that you might do something bad. Um, that's not in line with your values on being a good father. So we have you do the valued behavior of keeping their diapers dry, giving them a bath, cuddling with them, rolling with them on the floor. Even if you're feeling anxiety, shame, disgust, guilt, um, experiencing images at that time, even if you experience... Um, a groinal or a sexual arousal during that time, which we do know through research to not be an indicator of whether somebody is at risk of offending. Um, there are plenty of people with OCD who experience arousal more out of anxiety than anything else. Hmm. So I, I'm looking for a link between valued behavior and then a tolerance and an, an acceptance of the internal stimuli that's going on. Yeah. No, thank you. That's uh Oh, that's useful. That's a good distinction. Um, similar to that, you mentioned it, which is pedophile-themed OCD. Um, yeah, I guess it's good to kind of go into that. It's not really something that's been talked about on the show, <laughs> so any any detail you have would be good. You would be shocked by how prevalent this is. Nice. Um, I, I have a blog post up on my website that I wrote a few years ago about it, and I get emails every week, mul multiple emails from around the world with people saying, I didn't realize that this was a thing. And I would say that probably about a third of my caseload at any given time is persons struggling with pedophile OCD or P OCD. Mm. Um, it's the kind of OCD that you never want to admit to anyone, especially a mandated reporter, because then what if they call family services and get your children taken away? What if you have to go to jail? Um, what if they confirm that your worst nightmare is true about you? So they're very hesitant to share this information. So they, they may present to a therapist's office talking about contamination OCD or perfectionism, but behind the scenes, what's actually torturing them beyond torturing them is this idea that they may lose control and hurt a child or, um, have a secret desire to hurt a child, mm -hmm. especially one that they're close to, like their own child or a niece or a nephew is often what we see. Yeah. Wow. No, it's, it's, 
I don't want to say it's good to hear that it's prevalent because that may come <laughs> across wrong. It's reassuring to know that for those that, that that come across or have those obsessions that they're not one in a billion people. They're in fact, it's more common than people realize. It definitely is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then what a question that I'm guessing people are going to be curious about, and I definitely am, is from an ERP point of view, from an exposure point of view, how do you do exposures with this theme? So some traditional exposures that, that therapists would often use would be like, for instance, to go to a park and rate the attractiveness of the children walking by hmm. um, or to, um, you know, again, like a lot of it happens around basic bathing and grooming activities or cuddle activities. Hmm. Um, so diaper changes, bathing, um, bedtime routines, just cuddling on the couch. So it would be to find a way to, I mean, in general, people with POCD are completely avoidant of those behaviors by the time they get into treatment. So it's really getting them to actually engage in that behavior. Um, so it might just be as simple as your daughter has a diaper rash and needs this cream applied. And your homework for this week is to apply the cream as prescribed. And you need to rate your suds level while you're doing that and report back to me the data points. Like what happened here? What did you notice? Um, what were the body sensations going on? Um, what were the thoughts you had? Were, like, were you able to do it? Did you avoid? Did you ask your wife to step in? Things like that. Mm. So we're kind of just collecting like, what happened when you did this behavioral experiment? What what happened when you were sitting in the park and writing down numbers about, you know, what each child's attractiveness level was? Mm. Okay, yeah. So it's actually much, much simpler than you'd think um, <laughs> and safer. But there totally was... scary. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. much so. Yeah, and you're right about the, I can imagine, the avoidance is through the roof for this particular theme. So a lot of the hierarchy, exposure hierarchy, is probably just getting people to stop avoiding all the yeah. day-to-day stuff with their kids. Well, and, you know, again, because, I mean, I, I used to be a more traditional ERP therapist and I've moved more into the ACT realm recently. But um, one of the things that I talk about with a lot of my clients is valued behavior. Like, did, did you have these children to stay on the other side of the house and never interact with them? Is, is that what's going on here? Because what, what we know about OCD is that it preys on values. It attacks what's most precious to you. There's a reason that that father is having POCD intrusions rather than symmetry, you know, preoccupations. It's because his children are one of his most deeply held values. His role as a father and a protector and a provider and a nurturer are important to him. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we tap into those pieces, amplify them and get him to base his behavior on those rather than the alarms going off. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Okay, and of that, we'll we're going to the values piece. A using that in kind of the exposure side of things, but also would that be okay? What matters to you in life, whether that's the children and obviously other things, whether that's the sport or um, being stereoty- very stereotypical here around guys, or you know your <laughs> career, or whatever it is. Um, trying to improve the amount of activities they're doing in their week around those values. So nothing to do with the anxiety, but just what you want to be spending your time doing. My, my clients are experts on spending all day working on their anxiety and trying to reduce it. Um, I tend to be what's called a strengths based therapist. I look for what's going right or what could be going right that, that you're missing at this point. And so basically if there's only X amount of space in the cup, it's not that we're trying to reduce the negative experiences. We're trying to fill up the cup with positive experiences. And when we do that, there's just less space for the negative and the brain learns by doing. So when you keep going and just continue the stereotypical piece, when you keep going to the soccer games and you watch your daughter and her little friends, you know, bounce around on the field and you keep doing that, that is exposure, but you're doing it because it's valuable to you in your life. Mm. And it just leaves less space for all that negative stuff to come in. Yeah. No, thank you. That was a really good illustration. Um, okay. So we've talked about ACT already. 
Um, but there are any just act generally in treating OCD. Are there any specific cases or examples that you want to uh, illustrate? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll have a little bone to pick about this. Um, <laughs> like, I, I think that act can sometimes get a bad rap that it's like um, secondary to ERP or something that you do, you know, after you've done the traditional hierarchy and more traditional exposure activities. Um, the way that I have come to understand ACT over the years is that it's really just a different language. So ACT is exposure. Um, it's a different way of doing exposure and it's a different way of talking about exposure. ACT is also response prevention. We're asking you to sit with your discomfort and find a way to just have a presence to that rather than try to fix it or push it away. Yeah. And all exposure activities are not necessarily about the thematic material. They, they may be built around that, like, am I clean enough? But really what they're getting you to do is sit with the discomfort inside, whether that's a thought, an image, an urge, an emotion, a body sensation. They're asking you to just have a presence to that and not fix it. That's what response prevention is. So to me, ACT and ERP are basically the same thing, but one is French and one is Spanish. And so it's just kind of a question of, does somebody learn French better or Spanish better? Or do they need a combination of both? Um, and I find it very useful in kind of a day-to-day -day way. And I've also found it very useful for really stuck cases where somebody's been through a treatment program, they've maybe cycled through a number of OCD therapists and haven't made traction with more traditional ERP techniques, um, that this can be a way to get people on board when they're feeling really defeated and helpless. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, i got a few things to, to say on this topic. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think one especially since doing this podcast three years in now, a lot more therapists are merging ERP and ACT together anyway or doing them, mm -hmm. using them to complement one another. Other therapists on this show, one in particular very well known said, or in terms of research said, uh, they are basically the, the two sides of the same coin, kind of as you just said. Um, when I did my master's, I did a dissertation on... Um, a systematic review looking at all the studies of ACT as a treatment for OCD and it was it was as effective as ERP. Uh, my main criticism of it was that, that a lot of the studies weren't randomized control trials, they didn't have big enough population but in terms of early indication it, it was promising. Um, <laughs> the The only reason I don't point people in the direction of uh, OCD therapists who pretty much only use ACT. The only reason I don't do that is because A, I don't really know any. I know maybe two. <laughs> uh, and B, I know that if I can point someone in the direction of an ERP therapist, they're going to be usually pretty good or, or know what OCD is or whatever or how to treat it. Most ACT therapists, I'm just maybe doing them a disservice here, I don't know if they know OCD. Right. I know they know ACT, but do they know how to apply ACT to OCD? And that's the thing at the minute. I think in the, the therapist community, there needs to be more of an understanding. Kind of like there is in America, you've got the BTTI for teaching ERP to therapists. There almost needs to be a BTTI for teaching ACT to therapists, for specifically for OCD. But, and I, I very yeah. much agree with that. Um, you know, I wouldn't, if I had a child and my child had OCD, um, I would be fine with them seeing a therapist who primarily used an ACT orientation if they had a background in ERP and also had that as their kind of formulation that they were working off in their heads. Mm -hmm. um, ACT is becoming a more popular therapy for a number of things. It's transdiagnostic. It works for a number of different mental health diagnoses, not just OCD. So mm -hmm. you would definitely want a therapist who knows ERP, knows OCD, um, what I would say, though, is that for therapists who are in private practice, it can be challenging to have a strict ERP approach because we, we might have three sessions a week with a client and go out into the community and do a, do a community exposure. But at the end of the day, we are spending max three hours a week with that client and then sending them off to their home and hoping for the best that they do their homework. Mm. Um, so 
for me as an outpatient therapist who's not working in a larger hospital or clinic or agency, is not seeing clients for long periods of time during the week, um, I'm having to kind of meld the two approaches and have a lot of flexibility in my, um, in my interventions with clients. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, that's a good point. And, uh, I, yeah, I just hope more of the current OCD therapists who obviously use ERP, uh, take up ACT and see how it can work for them alongside ERP. There's no, there's no need necessary any need to do either one individually. Um, but yeah, or find some way of getting current ACT therapists to fully understand OCD and if they can do <laughs> yes. that. Um, yeah. Agreed. Uh, cool. And I hope there's also more research into ACT for OCD. Um, I haven't looked at the research for a couple of years, but hopefully there's been more. Um, okay, so is there any... I think that was an important discussion. Is there, are there any like specific examples beyond what you've already given in terms of ACT applied to OCD? Sure. Um, I had a woman a few years ago who had actually been through the OCDI program um, outside of Boston, you know, hmm. world-renowned program. They, they see a lot of my clients, and they, they do amazing work. Um, she had also seen, I think it was three other OCD therapists, and um, by the time she came to see me, she was avoiding pretty much everything. She was only eating chicken sausages and chocolate bars. Those were the only two foods that she was allowed to eat um, for various um, contamination fears. And um, she had done a ton of traditional treatment, and it wasn't, it wasn't really clicking for her. Um, so what we did was... Um, she, she placed, as I'm sure you can guess, a very high value on her personal wellness and health. And that's why she was avoiding doing things that would be, um, in the interest of her health and wellness, like eating a wide variety of foods. <laughs> um, so one of the things we talked about is what are you missing? And she really missed fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and her prior exposure activities had been kind of like bite into this apple, chew it, um, feel the things that you're feeling, note what's coming up. But she would have such intense panic sensations when she would do that, that she, she was pretty much just ready to throw in the towel on treatment. So what we worked on was, was doing more of a development of desire. Like, okay, so you missed this thing. Hmm. I'm not going to let you bite into the apple. Like you're not even allowed to approach um, the exposure opportunity here. I want you to develop the fantasy of like, what was it like when you used to do that? Like the, the snap of the flesh and like that crisp, you know, juicy taste. And, you know, where would you get the apple from? Was it from the store? Would you go to the orchard? And, and I want you to develop the fantasy of what you've been avoiding. And so we, we worked for weeks on just developing that. And then we had her, um, you know, and, and as, as, as I tell this story, I'm sure that you'll see that this is gradual exposure, but we were doing it in a act themed format of talking about valued behavior. And so I had her go to the orchard, buy apples, put them out on the table, but she was not allowed to try to eat them. And so I'm also forbidding her from doing the thing that she's been avoiding, which develops that desire and longing for it. Then I would have her just cut an apple open, smell it, you know, think about, do I miss it? Do I want it? She couldn't even make it that far, to be honest. Um, those were the assignments. She went to the orchard and she pulled an apple out of the orchard basket and ate it because <laughs> mm. she was just so in touch with like, I want this thing and I miss it. And OCD's taken it away from me. So by the time we had even gotten there, it like it didn't spark panic. She was just ready to do it because because she was so in touch with why she would want it. So it's kind of um, a difference between like confronting your fears versus tapping into what's important to you in life and using that to motivate your behavior. Yeah. No, that's, that's a brilliant example. Um, I saw a quote today as well, and I can't remember it, but it, it perfectly sums up what you just said. It's gone. Um, but yeah, no, that was brilliant. Are there any others like that? Hmm. I'm sure I have a million examples, but... 
but you're putting me on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> I can't think of them. Don't worry. Uh, I, have, I have examples every single day. Um, here's the, here's the one question, given like case examples, that I probably should pre-warn my guests on so they can have a think. Because <laughs> no one can ever give me a, a, more than one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I would be the same. Um, okay, cool. Well, let, let's move on. Um, and if anything pops up, let me know. Um, so, so as you said earlier, your master's was in sort of creative therapies. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you use that skill set that you learned today in your treatment of OCD? So I use the, the basic tenets of it, I would say, um, where, you know, as adults, we don't play enough. Yeah. We don't enjoy enough. We don't indulge enough. Um, we work and we get things done and then we're done with the day. So the other thing that we don't do, especially if we have an OC spectrum disorder is laugh and find the humor and the levity and the silliness in life. Um, so being an expressive arts therapist allows me to be very flexible with my clients. I can think outside the box and think, you know, for instance, if someone has a dust phobia, um, or that's part of their OCD that like they're afraid that there's dust on things and there's skin cells in that dust. And then that means that I'm, you know, inhaling or eating another person. If I touch the surface, then the dust is in me. Like what we might do is actually go collect dryer lint, um, out of, out of their dryer in the basement and make art with that so that there's, there's a process of exploring the material that's been avoided Hmm. of using it to make something beautiful out of something that had been feared. Um, another example that I often do because I, I do see a lot of ARFID avoidant restrictive food intake disorder in my practice. People who aren't having eating disordered behavior out of the goal of trying to lose weight or manage their body, but rather it's an aversion to um, slimy things or all brown foods, for instance. One thing that we might do is finger paint with pudding just to play and experience kind of that yucky sensation and then lick our fingers and laugh. I use a ton of humor in my therapy. Like basically my clients and I are laughing the entire session, which is, I think it's very purposeful on my part because OCD is taken so seriously and it's taken so much from my clients' lives. And I want to get them back in touch with living and that part of living that feels joyful. Um, So that's kind of where my expressive therapies background comes in yeah no that's just really interesting and good examples uh and i agree on humor i think um people do get robbed of it i think in all walks of life they get robbed of it as they get older (laughs) um but especially ocd um and i just want to point out that i gave you two case examples there to to make up for my lack of case (laughs) examples previously (laughs) i appreciate it um okay so uh a question that i've had few times is when to reduce or when is it time to reduce therapy whether that's like the amount of sessions or the frequency in which you see your therapist are there any kind of things to think about or any guidelines or I mean again I think it's going to come down to the program that you're participating in or the specific OCD specialist that you're working with I can speak to how I set up my practice, which is that I try to keep a revolving door going with my own practice. And I prepare my clients in the first few sessions that this is not meant to be a long-term therapeutic relationship. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that because we're rolling on the floor laughing and finger painting with pudding that my clients want to stay because it becomes a lot of fun. Mm. But eventually I have to kind of move them out the door because they're graduating from treatment. And so what what I do with my practice is I set that expectation in the first few sessions that we're probably going to start weekly or it kind of depends on the case. We might meet two or three times, you know, a week in the beginning or if it's not a super severe case and they can't, you know, afford to come, they can't miss work or whatever, then we might meet every other week or something. Um But I set the expectation that however we start, um, if therapy is working, it's going to be gradually reduced over time. So if you're meeting with me weekly, you might do that for the first few months. And then we're going to start scaling back to every other week, giving you opportunities to take these skills and what you've learned in here and apply it in your real life. And um, 
I'm moderately available to my clients between sessions. You know, if they run into a little roadblock, it's not for major issues, but if they're kind of like, what do I do with this? Then I tend to be available to kind of problem solve between sessions. But the expectation is that eventually they're moving back to every three weeks, once a month, and then every six weeks. And then eventually my clients quote unquote graduate. What we do then is create like a self-care kit or a relapse prevention kit um, where we put together all of the tools and resources that they have gathered in treatment. So they have kind of this physical reminder if they need like, you know, a list of resources or tools to use to remind them to stay on track. But my clients all know that then my doors open for booster sessions. So for instance, this week I have a client who was gone at college all year and he's done brilliantly, but he messaged me, I need a booster session. Some stuff starting to come up. It's a topic that hadn't come up before. I don't know how to deal with this theme. Can I get in with you? And so, you know, I'll probably meet with him just a few times. I tell my clients, get in as soon as possible for the booster sessions. And we just kind of brush you up and then we send you out on your way again. This is not meant to be that you're, you know, wasting away 12 years in therapy. Like if if I'm seeing you for that long, I'm not doing right by you and I need to be doing something different. So that's kind of how I construct it. Okay. Yeah, no, no, good. Thank you. And so, yeah, so anyone who's in that predicament, um, also just talk it through with their therapist right just right yeah and 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 it may be that the therapist hadn't thought of that that like you know the idea of booster sessions could be a thing like maybe it is time to cut the cord and the client goes and tries some of this and maybe they'll be back in a month maybe they'll be back in a year but like we do need to trust our clients to fall on their face and be resilient and cope with it and pick themselves up and we'll be here if they need a little help with that yeah yeah good point um, cool. Thank you. So general question now, it's just any words of hope for those with OCD? Yeah. I mean, I can just speak from a personal standpoint that I feel for me, like I've conquered pretty much everything except my fear of public speaking. I shake in my boots every time I'm doing it. Um, and I still do it. So that would be my message of hope is that you can still do the thing that, is in line with what would make you feel like you're living a valued life. So if I had to ask myself, would I rather be sitting in the corner and not helping clients or would I rather submit a proposal to present at the conference this summer and try to help a few people? I want to be that kind of person that helps people. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm having a lot of panic sensations, high blood pressure, rush of adrenaline, racing heart, feeling like I'm going to faint, I still want to be the person that gets up and makes an attempt to do that than the person who sits in the audience. So I can say that my clients like bowl me over every day, Stu, like they are just inspirations, the scary things that they're willing to do, the brave places they're willing to go, the risks they're willing to take. Um, And pretty much all I do is see people get better. I don't see people stagnate and I don't see people get worse. Like if they're in the right treatment, there's a ton of hope. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. That was was inspirational. Um, Okay, so uh, you could pick up the phone and call your 20-year-old self. What would you tell her? (laughs) Hold on. (laughs) I I would say um, when when you're approaching 40, no one's ever going to be able to pay you enough to go back to age 20. (laughs) So just hold on (laughs) is what I would tell my 20-year-old self. But I would also say try to have a little more fun. I mean, you're in your prime. Um, it's not that serious. It, it can feel that serious, but that, that might just be a false alarm. It, you know, it may not be that serious. Life may not be that scary or, you know, that, that threatening. It may just feel that, that way. Yeah. So I would say, um, you know, basically just like keep the hope, grow up a little and try to enjoy life a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, sound advice. Um, okay, so next question is, you've got a billboard in Boston, for example. What do you want written on that billboard? It's so funny because normally I feel like I would be stumped by a question like that, like, uh-oh, you know, mm. but I know exactly what I want on that billboard. And it's it's what I tell my clients. Um, I did a lecture recently, and it was my last slide in the lecture. It, it would just be a mantra that I want 
for my clients or anyone listening to have in their heads. And it's, I am a competent, capable, resilient human being. Mm. And we know that anybody who's listening to this right now is because they've survived a ton. They're still here listening to this podcast. So the evidence supports that they are a competent, capable, resilient human being. Mm. A lot of what we do with OCD and any kind of fears in life is we try to prevent a feared outcome. And so rather than focusing on trying to make that scary thing not happen, I want my clients to focus on what they already know, which is that even if the scary thing happened, they've got this. They've picked themselves up in the past. They've dealt with hard stuff in the past and they can do this. So I would just have it say you are a competent, capable, resilient human being. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely. Um, And is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you wish you could have shared today? Probably a million things, but maybe we'll talk again. (laughs) Sounds good. Thank you for doing this podcast. Like it's such a gift to to a huge community. I mean, you reach so many people. So thank you. No, I appreciate it. It means a lot. And uh, thank you for coming on. It's it's great to finally get you on and and talk about so many different topics um, and such a clear explanation of ACT and ERP. So thank you. So there you have it. Really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jamie Valdez. And if you enjoyed the episode or the podcast generally, it would mean the world to me if you'd leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to it as it helps me reach more people. And a quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It's not a placement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.